All right, Logan. Yes, sir. Logan, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I grew up in California, Bakersfield, California. Um, I, we moved whenever I was 11. We moved to uh, Odessa, Texas, uh, whenever I was 11. My dad's job at Bakersfield, it's an oil town. Uh, and we moved to Odessa, Texas, Midland area, because uh, of his job at the time. How do you describe your childhood? Uh, roughly, or, uh, like, it's all right, I think. Like, he, I mean, I don't have, like, a, a horrible childhood, I don't think. Like, I don't remember anything gnarly, nothing really. What kind of kid you in high school? Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I, I didn't graduate, I dropped out. Uh, sophomore year, I think, um, and I just went to work. You know, everyone in my family, my cousins, even my mother's in the oil field, everyone is, so I just left. So you worked in the oil fields? Yes, sir, yeah. That's what I, what I was gonna do. That's why I dropped out, was just everyone, there's so much money in it. Like, why, is, why stay in school and go in debt in college when, I mean, I was 17 making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Working in the oil field. Working in the oil field. I mean, you're working hard, and you're not you're not having fun. You're getting dirty on a rig, but you know, I was a caser, and I, I won't. I can't say the name, but um, yeah, the company I worked for was great. They, they treated me good. I got paid really well. Um, you know, I had four four cars. You know, I had everything I ever wanted, and I had any. I had. I would go buy brands in stores. Uh, I was happy. My and my all my family. We all made money. We were doing great, and. Uh, yeah, of course, I, I dropped that and I, I mean, I had fun with my money. I didn't, I was a kid. I, I didn't know, uh, like, what to do with it. <laughs> I didn't invest a dollar. One of the things you liked to do with it was skydive, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I started skydiving relatively, like, it's pretty new for me. I'm not, any, I'm not a professional skydiver, first and foremost. Like, How old are you? I'm 28 right now, sir. I started jumping whenever... It hasn't even been a year whenever I had my first skydive. But whenever you become a student at schools, I mean, you can, I mean, at least the one, I can only speak for one because I was only at one. But uh, yeah, you can jump as much, as much as that plane's going, you can go, you know. I mean, what was your goal with it? To, uh, to just have fun or you wanted to become an instructor? I wanted to be an instructor. Yeah, I would, I, I would most, some people, I forget, I don't know, it's in a movie, there's a quote, but. Some people do this thing, they, they, for this feeling, they do certain things. Some people rob places or people, some people do drugs, some people do whatever. You know, my fix was the sky, it, it, the adrenaline dump that you get from just taking one step. There, it's so easy and it's so much fun. Like right now, even with everything considered, like I would still go. That was my crystal meth. I I would I dropped everything for it. My my me and my old lady Meg, she we moved to San Antonio to be just closer because we were in Odessa. I had a good job. She had a job there. Everything was fine. We were making money, doing good. Just quit it all, leave, and to go jump. I want. That's all I wanted. She supported me in that, and she thank God she's a nurse. You know she can. Uh, help me in that and she can get a job anywhere hmm. but so you got into skydiving T tell me what happened to you uh three months ago this summer uh, i got into skydiving because of my girl she took me uh for my first tandem for her birthday she's already been and from there it was just love at first sight i loved it from the moment i would drive four hours every weekend to go jump um and recently uh and about three months ago, give or take, uh, I had an accident. I, I, I was on my last jump for graduation for my A license, and that's really I'm a super new sc skydiver. Uh, it's about 25 jumps, um, and that's a lot to someone who has never jumped. I, I understand that, but I've personally met somebody with 12,000 jumps, so 25 is nothing. To, they do that in a weekend. Anyway, uh, 
It was just like any normal. The last jump, that's supposed to be your fun jump. You you tell the that's the first time really you tell the instructor what you're going to do. And you've learned everything that he had to show you. You learned how to flip. You learned how to swoop and duck. You learned how to do things such as, uh, you know, deploy and just to prove to, you proved to him already you can do it safely. And I did. I proved to him uh, enough that he was confident. And uh, he let me go many jumps before. In this one, I just told him, hey, man, I just want to do flips. I want to, you know, I love doing the fronts and back flips. And you have about a minute of free fall. And you're falling at 120 miles an hour. And you, at that point, they allowed me to wear a face shield. Uh, it's just, uh, it's kind of like, a, if you could describe it, it's just like a, like a street bike helmet, uh, so to speak. But it's a little bit rised up in the back. Anyway, um, I'm falling. Everything's fine. Uh, I had a time in my life. It, the minute goes on, it feels like uh, um, it, it feels like five minutes. It feels like a good long time. Uh, I got to deployment time, 4K. I waved and I said, "See ya." And whenever I did that, uh, please mind you, I'm of the my father and the instructors came and see me in the hospital and they told me what happened. I haven't watched the video myself. I have a vi there's a video. I can't bring myself to watch it, but uh, uh, they explained everything that happened to me. And if I do get that, I might have to pause just for a second. But um, when I deployed, I just had a misfire. My parachute deployed and I'm good. And then they said I looked over and I have two parachutes up. Um, that's fine. We train for that before every jump. It doesn't matter if it's our first or 25th. We're practicing our EPs and I know what that is. It's side by side. It happens. You know, Th these are equipment that gets jumped multiple times every single day and it's packed by a human. It wasn't by me. It was by a person trained to do these things. And so I see it and okay, we got we got a problem and it's usually really easy. You you uh, untoggle, which pretty much means put it in drive. And you very, very gently, you don't do sharp turns or flares all the way down, nothing like that. You just go, you know, you just land wherever you're going, that's where you're going. And you got to think like you have two massive pieces of fabric on top of you. Well, um... Unfortunately, uh, I hit a situation where uh, it got worse. It's called a downplane. And what happens is, I don't know if it was the wind that caused it or if I messed up personally, if, if I messed up personally, but uh, it started a downplane, which means it separates, which means there's no fabric now on top of my head. And maybe at this point when final, whenever every, all the fabric goes over my head, I probably lost about a thousand foot in give or take. I don't know. I wasn't looking at my altimeter after 4K, so uh, I don't know where I was at. I couldn't, I don't remember that part anyway. And my instructor was above me or below me because he didn't pull at my time. Um, he pulls below me to make sure that I'm deployed unless he had to come up to me and deploy my stuff to save my life. That's his job. But uh, I was deployed. He went down below. And, he, and in the video, you can see me. Uh, there's two. And anyway, I got a down plane. Uh, at that point, they told me that I cut away, which you're supposed to do. You're supposed to. You can't. Usually a normal would be cut away, pull reserve, but my reserve is already out. Your cutaway handles here and your reserves here. I cut away, I punched, pulled, like I was supposed to do. I was trained to do that. And uh, when I did that, um, apparently my parachute wanted to go into my reserve. And uh, now I have no, there's nothing above my head, nothing. And uh, I mean, you. I can't, I fell from, pro, I would, if I had to guess, maybe like 2,500 to 2,000 feet-ish, I, I don't know, and the speed, 
no one was right next to me. I don't know how fat, I mean, I could use my imagination. I had a, a, a shirt probably above my head because there was no two open canopies open. One was trying, I'm sure, but it had another canopy inside of it. So it was just mangled mesh. Uh, at that point, uh, I imagine, I mean, that, that again, these memories were taken from me. I don't, it's just a defense mechanism. I think no one wants to know what happened after that, but. You don't recall any, oh my God, I'm gonna die moment. Uh, mainly in the hospital. Um, from the point of, I, first, but before you go into that, t tell me what you hit before when you hit the ground. Oh, I, I hit, um, luckily close to my DZ where my drop zone is where I, where I, that plane took off. There's an area where we, we come up before a jump. I forgot to mention is a, a landing pattern. When we jump. We jump at a very specific time before we leave that plane. I know where that drop zone is. And I can look down from the plane and see it clear as day. Okay, cool. There's the runway. We're good. Uh, I'm jumping at 14,000 feet. And I know that if I jump and I deploy at 4K, I can make, I mean, it might take me a second to, I see it, okay, cool. And then make my adjustments and land. Where I landed whenever I had my malfunction, uh, was in a cornfield that was relatively close, close enough that unfortunately, or fortunately and unfortunately for some, they seen me hit the ground. They was, it was just, uh, they have a spotter out there to make sure everyone makes it back. And I, I made it back, all right, thankfully close enough and I hit the ground. Uh, when that happened, they again, Thankfully, uh, they send a life flight. When a life flight happens, it's a helicopter, and, and, and they had a helicopter come pick me up, and I was, I was in bad shape. It was, there was no, there's no sugar coat in it. It was, I mean, it's, uh, it was bad. Uh, I had inside internal hemorrhaging uh, from my spine. Uh, I was bleeding. From the inside out, I, I was just—I was bubbling up. My uh, my jaw uh, uh, is broken in three places from the impact, and I was wearing a helmet, so it tells you like I could only imagine what would—I don't think I'd be here if I didn't have a helmet on. Uh, and I wasn't wearing it first and foremost for protection. I was wearing it because it's comfortable. It keeps wind at your eyes. You don't have to wear those goofy goggles that are uncomfortable that crush your face. You put on, boom, strap, and you're good. I didn't wear it for safety, but thankfully it, it did its job. Uh, but, yeah, I broke my jaw here, here, and then it split down the middle here. Um, I broke six ribs. on, and, and, again, whenever I landed, I forgot to say, I landed on my right side. It, 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 I landed, um, it's hard to describe, but pretty much just solely on this side of my body completely. And I don't know where my arm was, but it was damaged in the, in the fall too. And I landed on my ribs in my chest, but I broke six, six ribs too. And, um, uh, I broke my sternum. Uh, I broke a toe somehow, of course, on my right side. I severed a nerve in my back and exploded my L3. Um, and you beat your tongue? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's probably hard to see, but on both sides of my tongue, I didn't get it in half or anything, but I guess the impact, it just jarred my mouth closed and my tongue just so happened to come out at the same time. So if you stick your tongue out, and bite down on the sides. That's what happened. The idea of stitches on my tongue and it sucked. Uh, that was horrible. But, uh, yeah, I had um, internal hemorrhaging, of course. Um, but thankfully, they, when I got to the hospital, they, they worked me up pretty good. They, uh, they had me on a, a drip, dilated. Um, and I've never, I, I've taken, when I, like I said, I had fun as a kid. I did. I, I did my fair share of 
testing, you know, certain substances out and stuff. I never really had a problem, so to speak. There was one point in time I thought I was going through withdrawals. Uh, I will say I have been through withdrawals and it wasn't my choice per se. It was because of Dilaudid. Uh, anyway, uh, now, I'm, now I'm in the hospital. Uh, and th there's so many. I'm, I may be forgetting something. I, 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 it's so many things happened to me in that, that short area. And, I, and it was just three months ago. Yeah, yeah. It was very... Yeah, it was very early, but uh, yeah, it was quite a ride. I uh, all that happened, and uh, so now I'm I wake up, I come to, they wake me up in the hospital. I'm sitting there, and I don't know what happened. I'm asking people, like, where the hell am I? What's going on? And these are strangers, like, there's no one, in my, not, no one in my family, no one that I know, and no one, I have. Uh, at this point, they, I think they just took everything out of my nose because my mouth is uh, it's not wired shut yet. Um, it does, but it's broken still. And they're not telling me like, hey, we're about to do this. They don't say nothing. They say you were in an accident. That's all they say. You're in an accident. I keep hearing it. I'm like, well, what does that mean? I don't know where. How did I get in an accident? And they don't say anything. I don't know. They didn't. They didn't tell me nothing, and then I'd pass out, and then I'd wake up again. I don't know how long that went on for, but it kept happening, and it turned out I had two blood clots in my carotid arteries, um, and I did not know at the time, but I guess that can cause like strokes. I'm, I'm not medically educated whatsoever. I don't know anything other than a common cold. Uh, so I kept passing out. Once I'd finally got to see my family, thankfully they got to come down and see me and, and, uh, and my girl's a nurse. So she, I'm, she's telling me, hey, you, were, you, you messed yourself up skydiving. I'm like, there's no way. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't believe her. And then I pass out. And then I wake up and I'd ask her again, what happened? She said, you fell. You, you hit the ground hard. You can't move. Uh, I also found that I couldn't move, my, I, I couldn't walk. They wouldn't let me. They forcefully held me down. And anytime I tried moving, they would come in and tell me to stop, I wouldn't. And uh, they would put straps on my, on my arms and hold me down from moving. I could not move. They would not allow me to move. And that was so frustrating. It was horrible. Well, uh, when um, sorry, my bra the the brackets are jacking my mouth up while I'm talking. Um, um, it goes by, and I find out they they tell me finally what happened. They said, "Hey, you were in a skydiving accident. You exploded your L3, and because of that, we put a a bar. I don't know how long." It, it's probably, it's from my L1, which is kind of near your tailbone, to your L5 in your back. And I have a metal bar like that. I'll never be able to bend over for the rest of my life to pick anything up normally. Um, I mean, it's fine. It doesn't really necessarily bug me anymore. I'm pretty used to it now, but it's very frustrating sometimes. They told me I had a metal bar in my back, and I thought that was pretty rough but I didn't know what it was at the time. And they said, uh, and you probably won't be able to walk. Uh, that, that sucked. That was really rough to hear. But not so much for me, because I'm still in shock. And also, please keep in mind, at the time, I'm on Dilaudid and 15 other drugs. I have help there. And I didn't realize that at the time, but I had help from them, from my support team, and from the, the, the substances that they have given me to help me. And since uh, after that, then uh, I met um, the uh, plastic surgeon to do my jaw. 
uh, he said, are you ready? And I said, sure. And I didn't even know. He probably came in and talked to me. I don't remember it. Uh, he did, I'm sure, though, because I've met him since. Uh, I haven't been on anything. He's a great guy. He's awesome. He's here in, uh, in Austin. Uh, he's amazing. He's great. Uh, he uh, reconstructed my mouth. It took my jaw out. It's, I don't know if you could see it, but it's, it's kind of crooked now. Uh, but he, he took out a chunk. I don't know how big, but my bottom mouth now is crooked. It's, he probably took out a half inch or so because it was shattered. And it was probably from my face shield. Whenever I smack the ground, it probably took some severe damage too, went into my face and did a number on my jaw. Um, but yeah, he put it, he, he put me back together. And then he wired me up. Well, whenever I hit the ground, I, I hit it so hard when no one had a speed gun on me. They don't know how fast I was going. I mean, probably, I don't know, maybe 50 to 60 miles an hour, I'll say. I, I smacked the ground up. No parachute. It's horrible. Uh, I hit it so hard a tooth came up past my, it came out of my gums. I don't know how, because another one went down and got crushed probably by another tooth or something. At that point, uh, they wired it. They wired my shut closed with that tooth out of my gums. And my jaw would spasm so, so many times after the surgery, it would, all day. And that happened for probably, I think, five days-ish. It, it was spazzing out. And I'd be fine trying to talk, or I'd talk hard like this because I couldn't move my jaw. And then it would spaz, and I'd just start crying. It was horrible. It was the worst pain. I don't know if you've ever had a toothache. It was horrible. The, the nerve in your mouth are really sensitive, and it's just it's, it's a bad feeling. Uh, so I got it wired um, and it lasted for maybe about five days I don't know exactly I'd have to double check how long I had it on but I was in this this place for a month and uh, they didn't let me up for a month they would not let me up and I was getting freaking frustrated that is so uncomfortable going from walking and jumping and being free in this guy to being literally held down by force if necessary. And that will be by your loved ones and then you eventually get frustrated with your loved ones and you, you don't want to be around them because they're telling you don't move. And all you want to do is just stand up and you don't know. They tell you you can't walk. The doctors do. And I, I want to prove them wrong, so I stand up. And I'd try, but any time I would, they'd come in and they would threaten to strap me down. And that was even worse than not walking at all, so I'd sit back down usually. Anyway, um, I start working in rehab on, on PT, learning to walk again. And uh, they're really patient with me. I'm very jacked up at this point. I, I'm, I can't eat, really. I, I, they give me a protein shake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they're not good ones. I mean, you get what they give you. Usually, it was the strawberry one was the one I loved the most. It was nasty, but it was so much better than the chocolate one. That one was horrible. But you're going to drink it if you haven't eaten. And they make you. Or not like force feed you or anything like that. But they, they'll bug you until you eat. They make sure you eat. They're great people. Um, yeah, they... they uh, they start training me. Uh, I start doing like standing things. Uh, uh, I try to move my leg forward, which I still can't do to this day. Um, and uh, towards the tail end, they, they give me a release date. They say, hey, you're doing good in PT. You're doing good in OT. And that's occupational therapy, not physical therapy. It's still kind of physical therapy, but it's more of... Um, like weight training, like dumbbells. And physical training was more of walk related. Like, I'm gonna get you to do like a, 
not a stair climber, but they have their own version of it. It's easier, and I'm still on a walker, but I wouldn't walk anywhere at the beginning. I had to be pushed around in a freaking wheelchair by my, my old lady, by them, everywhere, until like the tail end, until I got my release date. Then I got strong enough, oh, and I learned again how to walk. Once I, once I did that, um, they would they would feel comfortable to leave me because this was a busy place. There's people coming in I seen that didn't have half of their face, and they didn't uh, they were in the same some maybe they didn't fall out of the sky or nothing. Uh, but I heard people have normal lives and just in a car wreck, and now they are missing a leg, or you know. Uh, there's a real. There's one story in particular that uh, touched me. Uh, it was torturous yet absolutely stunning and beautiful at the same exact time. Um, oh, sorry. This is this is. I always. I've never told this story and not cried. So I'm gonna do my absolute best. I might have to pause, but uh, like I said, they start. I knew what to do in PT. It was the same. It was clockwork almost. The, the, pretty much relatively same wor workouts. She'd tell me, I want you to do this. And I'd be like, okay, sounds good. And I have another uh, patient. I'm going to go help them. Is that all right? They would never just leave me. I would say, absolutely. That's, that's perfect. And to paint a picture for you of the place, uh, it, it was a big table with two wrestling mats on it. And that's what you'd lay on. And uh, I was getting good at walking. I have not walked by myself though, um, and that was not approved by them. And I was, I fell before, so I didn't get up. Um, she left, and I'm laying there, and I'm doing my workouts. And this kid, uh, this kid gets pushed in by his, um, I, I don't know if it was his mom or his dad. Uh, well, they're both of them, I mean, but I don't know if what their actual titles were. They looked and appeared as his parents. Um, but push their, push their kid in there, and there's not a teacher or a instructor with them. Um, and uh, I'm just working. I'm just minding my own business. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I've seen plenty of kids there. Um, horrible stories, I'm sure, but... Um, I, I I seen him a few days ago, and it made my old lady cry just seeing him because she just we don't have any kids or anything like that. But we just pictured like, man, it would be horrible to be in their situation. I mean, God forbid you have a child, and then you have to, you know, they're quadriplegic, and now you know, and at one point they weren't. That's horrible. I I don't even want to think about that. But unfortunately, that's the situation uh, that these people are were in. Hopefully, they're doing better, but. Uh, I'm laying on this mat, and uh, I'll just say the mom was sitting on, uh, it was on my right side. She was wearing a black shirt, and uh, the husband was wearing a white one, and uh, this young kid, maybe the age of 14, was uh, wearing a white one also, and uh, he was a quadriplegic for sure. Like, there's no doubt that this kid, I didn't hear a word come out of him. I'd hear noises. Uh, his eyes weren't open. He was breathing. Uh, his parents were talking to him. Uh, and that's one thing. They were so positive. And all I could think of was like what I was going through the whole time there. I was so sad that I could never walk. Uh, they told me I wasn't going to walk again. I mean, I was walking, but I was walking like a goober. Man, I was like so... I, I'm I'm considered crippled right now. And... I thought, like, I'm never going to be able to run casing again ever in my life. And I'm kind of getting depressed at this point because I'm working out, but I'm so impatient with my body. Like, I'm working out, and I'm not walking yet. Why am I not walking? Well, I still got a freaking walker. I got to get rid of this walker, but I got to work out. And I keep saying this to myself, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't, I'm, I'm still not better, but I have a better attitude now, because, thank, thankful for this kid and what... Uh, I experienced it, but anyway, uh, this uh, this mom is sitting there, uh, 
And while I'm having these thoughts in my head, like it was right as I was having these thoughts, this uh, this kid, uh, uh, he's sitting in his he's as, he's in a big wheelchair. It's not a standard wheelchair. It's one for special circumstances like his. And uh, th these parents don't know who I am. I never said a word to them. I was respecting their space and what they got going on. Uh, uh, but all I could hear was the mom uh, begging, uh, just begging her son and calling him by his name. And I still remember his name, but I don't know if his parents would like me to say it on this channel. So I'll, I'm going to hold that to myself. But I still know his name, his full name, uh, because his mom was saying it to him, calling him by his first name and telling him, you need to move your wrist. Just move your wrist. Please just move your wrist. And I stopped for a second just because, like, I could only imagine if he would have moved his wrist, it would have changed that mom's outlook. Like, gave that would have been like winning the lottery. He moved his wrist. Like, just something, anything. Like, it, it doesn't have to be like this or nothing. Just twitch at something. And it would have changed her outlook. And uh, I, I instantly thought, like, uh, I, I could not, I could not believe that I, I fell from four thousand feet, and I, 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 I tell people I, I've been in a skydiving accident. They say you're a miracle. No I'm, no, I'm not. I, I didn't do anything. The doctors and my family did stuff. I laid there on Dilaudid. I didn't do anything. I, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I, I'm strong because I had a great support system in place. And mainly because of this experience. Because at that point, I decided that I don't need to walk at all. This kid's not walking at all. And I get to tell my mom every single day if I want to that I love her. I can speak. I can talk. Uh, I, and I have my own thoughts and I, I'm in control of those thoughts. And I say that because in this facility there are individuals that do not have control of their thoughts nor how they speak. And I got to witness that and that was pretty hideous. But I had to lay there. That uh, my instructor usually left me for about an hour. I didn't have a clock near me, but it was about it was it seemed like a long time. And I had to listen to this uh, young lady plead her with her son to just move his wrist. And I was sitting there. I was rooting for him. I wanted him to. I was just, man, just do it, man. You're good. You got it. It's cool. And I'd give anything. I don't know if he's alive. I, I don't know. Sorry, this is gross. But uh, anyway, he, uh, he, I don't think he moved his wrist. Uh, hour goes by. I'm, I mean, I'm a, I can't move. I can't leave. I'm just listening to the dad laugh and talk about what happened. Turns out the kid was in a motorcycle wreck, in a dirt bike. Uh, I've been in several of those, man. Several. I don't know too many people that have fell out of the freaking sky and are living to tell this story. I don't, I can't wrap my head around why I'm alive. I don't know why. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. And this kid who's 14, who has a loving mom, it seemed, and a loving father, it seemed, uh, had a scar from ear to ear on top of his head and can't open his eyes anymore from a dirt bike accident. That's ridiculous. Like, I could not, I, I still can't understand that. Uh, it's horrible. It's, uh, I, I hope that kid's doing great. I mean, I, I mean, if not, I, I wish I could get in contact with him. I'd, I'd do anything for them, man. Like, they, they saved my life too. Like they played just as much part as 
my girl and my mom and those doctors did in my in my uh, rebuilding process. But I made. Do you feel lucky now? Oh man, that's a that's an understatement. I I feel lucky, but I'll tell you, man, if something were to happen right now at this moment in my life, I don't have bad days anymore. I, I was very. Uh, self-centered young man very like not I was just selfish man I was very selfish young man I did what I wanted to do I mean I made my old lady move so I can chase my dream and she's just still doing her thing but I did what I wanted to do and it was a full I completely accept my responsibility in doing that uh, and she I mean she didn't see it any gnarly way you know she knew I loved it and I mean what are you gonna do? You're gonna support the, you know, your fa your family member and what they love doing. I'm gonna do the same for her. I would definitely do it. But that kid, he, uh, they have no idea anything about this story. They didn't, I didn't go up there and say, oh, I didn't talk to him. I didn't say nothing to him, and I was too scared. But I was awestruck from that moment on, and I said to myself, I don't care if they take my other leg. I don't care if. Uh, I I lose my sight. I don't care. I'm fine. Like that kid, man. Like he he had not. He's not. He didn't have anything. I didn't see him. And I got. I man. I pray he has it now. I hope. I mean, I'd give anything to know. I don't know. Uh, I. I, I know his name. I haven't looked him up or anything like that. I don't. I, I'm kind of scared too. Just like watching my video. I don't. I don't really. Uh, I kind of figure, just leave it to, if if it pops up, uh, then I'll... Do you regret picking up skydiving? No. No, I'd do it again right now, if I could. But again, like, they, uh, USPA won't, I mean, a, a legit school, a jump school won't allow me to jump just because it's a liability. Like I said, if I deploy, it's going to tear my back up. I mean, it's not a... It's not a, they train you to make it as easy as possible when deploying, but it hits hard. It's a, it's a good jolt. I mean, you go from 120 to about 20. So you, you lose speed fast, like immediately. And my back won't allow it. I have a massive scar on my back and a lot of metal in my body now that I, I, w I, I don't know. I would love to skydive, man. I, I say that I would go, but Everyone says, like, man, Logan, you're a miracle. You did so many amazing things. Again, my family did. I wasn't there. I didn't have to drive four hours with the thought of, you know, my son being dead. <laughs> or my girl, you know, she just, uh, I, I think that she uh, was calling me. Because I, usually I would get home before she would be done with work. And I'd already be home. She knew I went and jumped, but I, I went and jumped many times and came home. And I was at home whenever she would get home from work, you know, at 7. Uh, I wasn't there. Uh, she didn't uh, uh, She didn't get an answer that day. Uh, yeah, she, uh, I imagine that was pretty rough, but thankfully it wasn't that far away. Uh, Your ability to move is improving? Yeah, slowly, very slowly. But again, uh, I try. I work out hard. Uh, I don't. Uh, I get to start PT again. They encourage me to do that. I get to. It's been a process to start again, but I get to do it again. And uh, whenever I uh, start that, I'm, I'm interested to see what they set me up or how it compares to how the physical therapy was. Logan, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? The most important lesson? Uh, is that I know I grew up knowing that everyone's got problems. Everyone's got stuff. I don't care who you are. I mean, I've seen, I've seen grown men, uh, men and women, and I'm talking probably grandmothers to to children, man, maybe of nine years old-ish, you know, boys and girls, unfortunately, but everyone's got problems, every single person. 
But what that little kid taught me was you have a lot of stuff that you should be grateful for. And unfortunately, I had to go through this whole experience uh, and still I deal, I deal with stuff uh, every day. Uh, but if I had to give, yeah, just one, one bit of uh, advice, I would say make sure you, uh, you, you treat every day and, and respect what you have because I've seen many people have normal lives and unfortunately uh, it's a, real, a, a brutally honest statement that you can, uh, you can lose something pretty, pretty valuable to you, not even, and you probably won't even know it. Every, everybody has something terrible going on in their life, but you have good things too, and you just got to find those. And may not be able to walk perfectly or run. I, I hope I never come in contact with a bear because I can't run. But I'll tell you right now, I I can uh, come visit you, you know, on command. Uh, I can come. I can go to my mother. I can speak to her anytime I wish. Thankfully, um, I can see. Uh, and this is too much, maybe, but. I can uh, I can go to the restroom whenever I want. I, I mean, I spent a month pissing and defecating all over myself, but I'll tell you what, I can, now I'm good. I, I can take care of that, and I can... There's people that aren't able to, because of the injury that I suffer from, because of a certain nerve in your back, which controls your lower half. Um, so thankfully, uh, uh, that, that was never a, a problem so to speak. But yeah, that would be it. You do have problems. Everyone's got problems and everyone deals with those differently. But please understand, you got a lot of things going for you that you may not, uh, you do take for granted. You can you can speak on command, man, and that's just enough. You don't need anything else. Trust me, that kid, and I promise you that mother would agree with, with what I'm saying. And I hope... Uh, if there's anything I could get for this, man, I would love them to hear that. Because uh, that's one thing I regret is, man, I, I wish I would have said something to them to let them know, like, dude, you, you guys changed my life forever. And that stands true today, man. I don't care if I can ever walk or run again. I don't care if uh, my other leg just decides to not work. I don't care if I could ever... Uh, I'll wire my jaw shut for the rest of my life, man. I'm good. I can still, you know, my I can move my wrist on command. And your mind works. Yeah, well, it's I'm still working on that one. <laughs> it, it works good enough, man. Logan, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry for the the crying. That's okay. You're a lucky man. Thank you, sir. Thank you.